Good afternoon. Shalom Aleikum. Ahlan wa sahlan. Ramadan Mubarak. Thank you to everyone who's here with us in person and online for taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend today's lecture entitled U.S. Defense Policy for Israel and the Consequent Humanitarian Aid Crisis, which is humanitarian crisis in Gaza. At a time when over 1.8 billion Muslims across the world are fasting by choice during the holy month of Ramadan, over 2.4 million Palestinians in Gaza are starving and dehydrated in what the United Nations has described as a human-made famine by the Israeli government. The Biden administration has been unwavering in its so-called ironclad support for Israel to the extent that it is our nation that is providing the diplomatic and military support while Israel conducts what the International Court of Justice has described as a plausible genocide. We are honored today to host two distinguished speakers, Josh Paul and Dr. Tariq Haddad, to examine how U.S. security and defense policy undermines American interests abroad and its most fundamental values at home. This event is hosted by the Rutgers Center for Security, Race, and Rights, which is the first and only civil rights center at a U.S. law school that focuses on law and policy that disproportionately harm Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities at home and abroad. We do so through lecture series, policy reports, op-eds, and our newly launched The Race and Rights Podcast, which I encourage all of you to subscribe to. Now, this work is not for the faint-hearted or the meek. For defending the civil rights of Muslim Americans and the human rights of Palestinians attracts and invites hateful attacks by groups who peddle the very Islamophobia and anti-Arab racism that CSRR's work aims to combat. But that is what we do here at the People's Electric Law School. We proudly center the voices of those with less power and less privilege in hierarchies of subordination in a racialized American society. Our social justice mission incorporates the reality that when one speaks truth to power, the powerful lash out, they defame you, and they seek to censor you. Change comes at a cost that is often borne by the subordinated communities seeking equality and dignity. But we stand strong on the shoulders of giants such as Arthur Pinoy, Al Slocum, Aideen Cobb, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who are all former professors here at Rutgers Law School, the People's Electric Law School, and who devoted their careers to racial justice and gender equality. And thus, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce two courageous individuals who have spoken truth to power at great risk. Josh Paul resigned from the State Department in October 2023 due to his disagreement with the Biden administration's decision to rush lethal military assistance to Israel in the context of its war on Gaza, or what some have called its war on Palestinians in Gaza. He had previously spent over 11 years working as a director in the Bureau of Political Affairs, excuse me, political military affairs, which is responsible for U.S. defense diplomacy, security assistance, and arms transfers. He previously worked on a security sector reform in both Iraq and the West Bank, with additional roles in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, U.S. Army staff, and as a congressional staffer for Representative Steve Israel, the Democratic uh, representative for New York. Mr. Paul grew up between London and New York and holds master's degrees from the universities of Georgetown and St. Andrews, Scotland. He is currently a non-resident fellow at the Organization for Democracy Now for the Arab World and a recipient of the 2023 Calafay, uh, excuse me, Calaway Award for Civic uh, Courage. And I will now cede the floor to Dr. Josh Paul, excuse me, to Mr. Josh Paul, after which I will introduce Dr. Tariq Haddad, who will follow in this bonus. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aziz. I'm uh, glad to be with you here. Uh, thank you a lot for having me. 
so just by way of a brief further introduction uh, and context, uh, until October, I worked in the uh, Bureau of Political Military Affairs at the State Department when I resigned really for three reasons. Uh, the first is that I do not believe, and I don't think anyone, uh, I'd like to think no one in government believes, uh, that we provide US arms in order to kill thousands of civilians. Um, and so first of all, the scale and the scope of what we have already seen at that point, uh, when between two to 4,000 people have already been killed in Gaza uh, in just over 10 days. Uh, and certainly what we have seen since uh, is not something certainly that I believe the US should be complicit in. The second reason was that this current situation in Gaza comes at the end of what I believe is a, a long track record of broken policies and a broken approach uh, both to the broader Middle East by the United States and also certainly uh, to the Israeli Palestinian conflict. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, and then the third reason uh, was that when I tried to raise these concerns in the context uh, of the decisions that were being made uh, to rush these arms, to expedite arms uh, to Israel for its use in Gaza, um, I was met with silence. There was no space for debate or for discussion. And one thing I've come to realize is that that's actually a microcosm uh, of much of American society today, where there are voices being silenced. Uh, whether censored in Congress, uh, docks on campuses, um, and this contributes, you know, in many ways to part of the problem we have right now, right? which is particularly in government, when you don't have a, a good debate, when you don't have space for discussion, you don't get good policies. So let me just back up very quickly and explain uh, what the political, Bureau of Political Ministry Affairs does, So I think that's some important context. Uh, particularly for the those of you, you know, in the law school, the law students here who are looking at the board and looking at international relations law and domestic law as relates to national security. Um, you know, it's interesting that the US government, the law, places the control of arms transfers under the State Department, uh, not under the Department of Defense, not under the Department of Commerce. And why does it do that? Uh, because ultimately, security assistance and arms transfers are seen as a tool of foreign policy. They provide us with influence over partners. They provide us with diplomatic inroads. They provide us with lasting relationships. Uh, and they are there to give us leverage. So by the way, when you hear uh, someone like State Department spokesperson Matt Miller say uh, that you know, we, don't, you know, we don't tell other countries what to do, that completely runs in the face of the entire design of the structure. The entire purpose of the structure is for arms transfers to give us the leverage to tell other countries essentially what to do. Um, and, you know, if that was not the case, so we spent the last 12 years working in the Department of Commerce, right? Um, and then, so within the State Department, within the Bureau of Political Ministry Affairs, there, there are a couple of buckets we need to think about here. Uh, one is you'll hear people talking about security assistance. And what we mean by that, um, at least in the context of, of the arms transfer world, is really the funding, particularly grant taxpayer funding, uh, that we provide to countries around the world in order to buy U.S. arms. Um, in a typical year, and this right now is not a typical period, mostly because of the conflict in Ukraine, uh, but setting that aside, in a typical year, the State Department receives from Congress about $6.1 billion uh, in taxpayer funding uh, to provide to countries around the world to buy arms, uh, American arms. Uh, in the case of Israel, Israel, out of that $6.1 billion, gets $3.3 billion, or over half of that. So that is already, you know, over half of our military, our foreign military financing uh, going to Israel. Uh, in addition, Egypt gets 1.3 billion, uh, part of the deal here, and this dates back to, uh, of course, the Camp David Accords, uh, is in order to secure the peace with Israel. So in other words, that's, that's almost a bonus to Israel as well. A um, couple of other very brief notes on this. Um, first of all, unlike every other country in the world, when Israel gets that $3.3 billion, it is considered obligated upon appropriation. So unlike every other country in the world, where we have to uh, you know, think about how we're going to spend it, and then notify Congress of our intent. Uh, in this case, as soon as Congress, essentially as soon as the President uh, signs the Annual Appropriations Act, uh, money is out the door. Uh, I know that the debate in Congress right now is for the Annual Appropriations Act for this current year, and they're expected to wrap it up by Friday. So that will be the remainder of this year's 3.3 billion out the door, regardless of what happens in the supplemental. Uh, another major difference, two other major differences, one is that uh, Israel's funding uh, as opposed to for most other countries, uh, except for Egypt, uh, it doesn't go to the Department of Defense, it goes to an interest-bearing account of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So they're not only getting $3.3 billion, they're getting Federal Reserve U.S. interest on top of that as well. Um, and then the final difference is that unlike every other country in the world, uh, they can spend 20% of that money within Israel uh, on their own defense industry. 
And we'll come back to this, but there's a land and security assistance piece. Then there's the arms transfer piece, which is also managed out of the political military affairs bureau, uh, which is both government to government sales uh, and what we call direct commercial sales or export licenses. Uh, I don't have, you know, because that varies so much from year to year, uh, specific numbers for Israel, but just to give you a sense on an annual basis, we're talking about $50 billion uh, in government to government foreign military sales and about uh, $130 billion in direct commercial and export licenses. So that's $180 billion of uh, defense trade flowing through uh, the Bureau on an annual basis. It's a significant chunk of change. Um, so let me back up quickly. And so let's talk about the history of US defense trade and US defense cooperation with Israel. Because I know it feels like we are in this moment where you know no one can question where there is no debate. That's not always been the case. And I think it's important to recognize that the relationship has changed and it's important to understand why it's changed. You know, if you go back to 1948, uh, Israel fought its war of independence with Soviet bloc weapons, uh, mostly with Czech weapons, actually. Um, and yes, you know, President Truman was the first head of state to recognize Israel, um, but the first government uh, on, a, on a statutory basis to go through a recognition of Israel was actually the Soviet Duma. Um, then you get to this point after there where, you know, Israel's initial alliances were not, again, with the United States. It certainly shifted out of the Soviet orbit. Um, but, of course, in 1956, we see uh, Israel join with France and the UK, uh, two sort of declining post-colonial powers at that point, uh, to try and take over the Suez Canal. And it's President Eisenhower, of course, uh, who threatens the credit rating of these countries, who threatens to fall in their loans and stops that. Uh, even 1967, uh, the war, the Sisi War, in which Israel conquers the West Bank, Gaza, and at that point Sinai as well, uh, was not a war fought with American weapons. It was a war fought with French and British fighter jets. Um, and in the wake of that war, uh, the US voted for and sponsored UN Resolution 242, which called on Israel to withdraw from the occupied territories. Um, I think you know, the turning point in many ways was 1973. And the invasion of Israel by the United Arab Republic, as it was then, or Syria and Egypt, as we know it now, which, of course, were aligned with the Soviet bloc. And it was in that Cold War context uh, that, first of all, President Nixon did not want to, to jump to Israel's defense, but Henry Kissinger uh, convinced him that, you know, look, we're on the downslide in, in Vietnam, uh, we need to, you know, stop the Soviet Union, and then we have this responsibility to Israel, particularly. Um, and that led to the opening of, you know, US military assistance to Israel, uh, in what was called Operation Nickel Grass. Um, and it was throughout the 70s then that the relationship began to knit. It was in the 70s, in 1976, for example, that Congress first passed uh, what we call a law regarding Israel's qualitative military edge. Um, and this is, remains US law. It's been strengthened since. Uh, what it means is that the US is obligated by law to protect Israel's ability to defend itself from other countries in the Middle East, any combination of countries in the Middle East, or non-state actors uh, while retaining minimal damage. And this is something that we are required to look at by law uh, in all of our arms sales to any other country in the Middle East. How is it going to affect Israel's qualitative military edge? Um, but even through the 80s, even as this sort of law system of you know this relationship was being knit, um, you know, this did not stop the US from criticizing Israel. Uh, so in 1982, 83, uh, during Israel's invasion of Lebanon, we see President Reagan, for example. Um, you know, standing up and uh, telling, calling that Bibi Netanyahu, then the Israeli Prime Minister, 14 hours into. Thank you. Oops. Sorry. That's going to stay there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. 14 hours into um, into Israel's bombardment of Beirut, um, President Reagan calls up Menachem Begin and says, "I'll tell you two things. If you don't stop your bombardment of Beirut, two things will be true. The image the world will have of Israel's war in Lebanon will be a baby with its arms blown off." and the US will fundamentally revisit its relationship with Israel. That was 14 hours in. Can you imagine President Biden, here we are, five, almost six months into this war in Gaza, making a similar call? So I, I cannot, and that is you know, how significantly the relationship has changed. And we're at the point now, and particularly you know, since Oslo, and in this sort of, so we went from the Cold War into this hegemonic moment where you know, the US emerged as this you know, effort to be a peacekeeper um, and you know, build the Oslo Accords, uh, but it was also combined with this moment in the world where there is no or there was no outside pressure. We were essentially free to do as we liked uh, in the broader world, to frame the world as, as best we could. Uh, in many ways, a missed opportunity. 
Um, but that, I think, combined with, you know, certainly shifts in U.S. law as regards campaign financing uh, has left, I think, America quite adrift in terms of its Middle East policy. And we are, if anything, frozen, perhaps in 1995, 1996, uh, where we continue to, you know, ascribe to the Oslo process as if it was a living, breathing process, as if, you know, a Palestinian state could be built uh, on the West Bank, uh, where you see, for example, right now, uh, settlements, uh, you know, crisscrossing the land, uh, 500,000, over 500,000 Israelis, 700,000, I think, uh, living in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem. Um, it's just a very different situation than it was then. Uh, and yet we have not changed our policies. We have not recognized that difference. Uh, the same is certainly true in the context of Gaza, where Israel's siege has gone on now, certainly since 2006. Um, where, you know, for years uh, it has been, you know, the impossible to imagine how the state, how Gaza and the West Bank might be linked together. And yet still this remains, uh, you know, something that the U.S. pays lip service to, uh, while at the same time providing arms to Israel that, you know, enable the occupation. I think that's an important point because the theory of the case since Oslo has essentially been security for peace. Uh, the theory is that if the U.S. makes sure that Israel feels secure, um, it will have the sense that it can make the concessions, for example, uh, to Palestinians in order to achieve peace. Uh, on the contrary, what our assistance has done is made Israel feel so secure uh, that it does not need to worry about the Palestinians. It does not need to make any concessions. It can continue uh, building walls, building settlements, uh, besieging Gaza. Um, and so, you know, our, our, the impact of our assistance uh, has actually been completely contrary to, I think, the intent of it. Um, and we are, of course, uh, in a situation where we are constantly reminded, uh, certainly in government, to refer to U.S. support to Israel as being ironclad. Uh, you'll have heard this uh, you know, phrase a number of times from senior officials. That's because it is drilled into everyone. Hey, you're going to the, uh, you know, going up to the Hill, going up to Congress to speak about, uh, you know, the Middle East. If someone asks you about Israel, what's the response? The response is, our support to Israel is ironclad. Um, by the way, that's how you know that we're talking about Israel, not Taiwan. Our support to Taiwan is rock solid. Um, so ironclad for Israel, rock solid for Taiwan. Um, and, and that's sort of the environment in which we live right now and in which, you know, the, the continuing support, the flow of arms has continued, uh, even in the context of what is, I think, very clearly uh, war crimes and other crimes in Gaza. So I want to very quickly touch on what some of those laws are that are relevant here, laws and policies. And let me see if I can pull up the right. There we go. Let's see. There we go. Um, all right. Um, so, uh, sorry, do you need to just press the? What am I pressing? Oh, I can't see it from here. That one. There you go. All right. There we go. Um, so. Here are some of the laws and policies that apply to U.S. arms transfers. We'll start with policy level. Remember, policy is not legally binding. You can always go around policy, but it is important. Uh, every administration uh, since Reagan has had something called a conventional arms transfer policy. Uh, each issues their own. And to its credit, the Biden conventional uh, arms transfer policy, or CAT policy, as we call it, uh, which was issued in February of last year, is the most forward-leaning, the best for human rights yet issued because of this language right here because it, for the first time, has directive language that says the transfer of arms will not be authorized, or no arms transfer will be authorized, when the United States assesses that it is more likely than not that the arms to be transferred will be used by the recipient to commit, facilitate, uh, or facilitate the recipient's commission of, or to aggravate risks that the recipient will commit, genocide, crimes against humanity, um, and other violations of international humanitarian and human rights law, including serious acts of violence against children. If you are telling me that the arms that we are transferring to Israel right now do not even aggravate the risk that Israel will commit serious acts of violence against children. I don't know if you're kidding, but this is the State Department's position right now, that it is not more likely than not. Um, I you know, find that very difficult to accept. Um, let's turn to law. So you'll recall that I was talking about the sort of the, these two buckets, security assistance, grant military assistance. Uh, and arms transfers themselves, the mechanisms through which the arms are transferred. So most of the US law that relates to uh, the arms transfer field actually attaches itself to the grant funding, not to the arms transfer. So if a country is buying weapons with its own money, for example, lady vetting doesn't apply. Um, but on the arms transfer piece, really one of the only things that apply is here, um, US 22 USC 2314, um, 
countries may only use the arms that they are being provided by the US uh, for the purposes for which they are furnished. Um, so the law goes on to list a number of purposes, including legitimate self-defense. Uh, does that apply under the Geneva Conventions to a context in which you have uh, an occupying power attacking the, power, the, the people who it is occupying? Uh, it does not. Uh, another purpose is operations that are you know, under a UN mandate. Uh, there is certainly no UN mandate here. On the contrary, uh, the UN mandate, if anything, is UN Resolution 242, which the US supported uh, for Israel to withdraw from occupied territories. So fundamental problem here, um, however, is that there is no hook. And this is the case for many of these uh, laws that apply to this sector. They are essentially up to the administration to enforce upon itself. Uh, there is very little right of private action, at least so far, found by the courts uh, to apply this. Uh, but that's that's the main part of the law which applies, relates to arms transfers. Then you come to uh, the parts of the law that attach themselves to grant funding. Leahy vetting uh, is the most famous of those. Uh, no assistance shall be furnished under this chapter to any unit of the security forces if the Secretary of State has credible information that it has committed a gross violation of human rights. Um, there is a different process for Israel than for almost every other country in the world, for almost every other country. Uh, before we provide assistance under uh, grant assistance to a military unit, we vet that unit. And if that unit, if there's a red flag, that unit doesn't receive the assistance. In the context of Israel, we provide the assistance first. And then we listen out for red flags. And we listen out for reports of credible violations of human rights. Uh, and as of today, the US has never sanctioned any unit of the Israeli security forces under Leahy, uh, despite there having been a clear track record of credible violations, gross violations of human rights. Um, Section 502B, uh, we saw Senator Sanders try to push a report on this uh, through Congress. I think it got 12 votes in the Senate uh, late last year, or maybe it was early this year. Uh, we cannot provide security assistance to a country, the government of which engages in a consistent pattern of gross violations of internationally recognized human rights. Uh, again, I think, you know, look at the track record here with Israel. Uh, finally, and this is relevant to the current context, uh, and is certainly the subject of a lot of debate, uh, Section 620I of the Foreign Assistance Act. No assistance may be furnished when it is made known to the president that the government of such country prohibits or otherwise restricts the delivery of US humanitarian assistance. Um, we have heard, we've seen a statement in the last few days from uh, USAID administration power, uh, administrator powers saying uh, that enough assistance is not getting through. We have heard National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, whose job description, right, is make Noah in chief to the president, right, uh, saying that, you know, US funded flower is not getting through. Uh, and yet again, uh, this is not being triggered. And the final uh, example I'll give you, and just to, to Note is that, of course, there is also currently a case before the U.S. federal courts brought by uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights on behalf of a number of Palestinian plaintiffs uh, seeking an injunction in part uh, in, in, as one part of it against the transfer of arms uh, to Israel. Uh, and this really hits on the problem, because, first of all, the court's initial response was uh, this is the policy question. We can't uh, politi political. This is a political question. This is a matter of policy. This is not a matter of law. Therefore, it's non-justiciable. Um, the Center for Constitutional Rights is currently appealing that to the Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. Uh, one of the government's other arguments that didn't, we didn't even get to uh, to test uh, in the federal court uh, original hearing um, was that, again, there is no private right of action, that if the Department of Justice wants to start prosecuting people for not enforcing the law, uh, it is free to do so. But you, American citizens, whatever your standing, uh, do not have a right to bring this to court, do not have a right to bring this to trial. Um, so there is a significant challenge here, I think, in enforcing our laws. And the irony, of course, is that we are also at the same time, uh, and I'll wrap up on this note, doing damage not only uh, to our own legal processes, uh, to the rule of law in this country by subverting and you know going around so many laws to continue to provide the arms uh, to Israel, but we are also doing great damage to the international legal system a system that for generations uh, Americans have been trying to build since the Second World War to create accountability. Uh, when we see a country like South Africa, of all countries, bringing forward this case for genocide at the International Court of Justice, and the US saying that it has, you know, it is not appropriate, it is not the right thing to do, we don't believe it is credible, and beginning to work to undermine the ICJ, the, as well as the International Criminal Court, where individuals can be held, uh, you know, accountable, um, I think we have to ask ourselves, what on earth are we doing? Are we tearing down the entire 
global you know rule of law uh, in order to facilitate war crimes it just makes absolutely no sense um so i will wrap up on that, on that note just to say that you know so the implications here are significant you know certainly and most evidently as we'll hear in a moment for the palestinians uh they are significant as well for israel right i don't think what israel is doing is going to make israel any more secure uh, on the contrary it is going to isolate it it is going to you know create generations more that do not want uh warm peace with israel and for the us it is also doing damage uh, both to our international standing to our global credibility to our relationships across the region um so i think the bottom line here is that there is simply no good in this in any direction in which you look um but the most important thing we can do i think right now uh is do what we're doing here to talk about it to have that discussion um and from that discussion from a freer and more open conversation we can hope that we can drive this country in a better direction thank you Thank you, Mr. Paul. Let me just Oops. unshare this. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Paul, for that um, in-depth policy analysis with very limited time. Uh, so I would encourage, we have a lot of law students in the audience and lawyers, as well as law students and lawyers in the virtual audience, um, to read up on this, right? Because these are uh, in-depth issues and they're technical issues. But I do think what's important is that we keep in mind the principle of equal enforcement and actual enforcement. And I'll ask a little bit more during Q&A about some comparative um, enforcement between Israel and other countries who receive uh, large amounts of foreign aid 